Welcome back to another episode of Space This Week. SpaceX's Super Heavy Booster 12 thundered to life during its static fire test last Monday, and Falcon 9 remained stuck on Earth following grounding of the entire fleet by the FAA, leaving China to be the only nation to launch an orbital mission last week. Artemis 2's SLS core stage began its 900-mile journey from NASA's Mishu Assembly Facility to the Kennedy Space Center. The Magix 2 mission launched aboard a Black Brand 9 to investigate the sun's corona. Viper is kill, Curiosity made an accidental discovery on Mars, Blue Origin did something, and much, much more. Enjoy. This is Booster 12, the super heavy first stage for Starship's fifth flight test, undergoing a full duration static fire on the orbital launch mount. Now with no evidence to the contrary, this test was a complete success, and a huge leap forward towards seeing the fifth flight of Starship, which, if all goes to plan, will feature the very first booster catch attempt by the launch tower's chopsticks. Excitement very much guaranteed then. After completing the static fire, the booster was removed from the orbital launch mount and transported back to the production area for final pre-launch checkouts. And the excitement doesn't just end with Flight 5's first stage. The second stage, Ship 30, has also finally rolled out of the high bay after an extended stay in there where it had its entire heat shield replaced. And here it is in all its glory. It was moved to Mega Bay 2, where it was then placed upon the mobile static fire test stand. From there, it was rolled out in the early morning out of the production area and down to the Macy's test site. And there it is! One interesting thing to note is that there are at least two missing tiles at the aft end of the ship, just like they were missing on Ship 29. Almost certainly a deliberate omission by SpaceX to see how well the stainless steel and ablative heat shield underlayer will cope without a proper tile covering them. There are a couple of clusters of missing tiles here as well. It's unclear if these are yet to be filled or will also remain absent of tiles for the flight. This part of the ship is not mission critical, as there's no fuel tanks underneath, so loss of structure shouldn't, in theory, be mission ending, though the Raptor engines might get a little bit cooked. Another test article that was recently rolled out for testing was a test tank that we believe to be a test article for the V2 Starship. Here it is leaving Mega Bay 2, down the highway towards Sanchez. Launch Tower 2 is rising at an incredible rate. Last Monday, I talked about how the first module had been stacked, and over just the last few days, we not only saw the stacking of Module 2, but we then also saw the stacking of Module 3. And right now, we're about to see the stacking of Module 4, as this latest piece was recently rolled out to the pad site. Incredible, really, how fast this thing is going up. And also reassuring, as SpaceX moves towards the age of tower catches, having a backup launch tower in the event of anything going wrong with the other one is a nice comfort to have. In addition to the three modules, we also saw the installment of the tower's elevator shaft. Falcon 9 remains grounded, following the second stage failure on the 12th of July Starlink launch, which saw the upper stage of the rocket suffer from a liquid oxygen leak, preventing second stage reignition, causing all Starlink satellites to be left in too low an orbit to be saved and were fated to burn up on Earth re-entry. Right now, all Falcon 9 launches remain grounded, while the Federal Aviation Administration works with SpaceX to investigate the anomaly, and as such, there's no SpaceX orbital launches to cover for the past week, which is certainly unusual. We did see a Falcon 9 second stage undergoing testing at McGregor, however, the first one since the launch anomaly, which might indicate good progress with revalidating Falcon. Time will tell. So with Falcon out of the game, there was only one orbital launch attempt made elsewhere last week. This came from China and was a Long March 4B that lifted off on the 19th of July, carrying the GFN 11-5 to low Earth orbit. Official reports have stated that the satellite is a high-resolution Earth observation satellite and will be used in a variety of fields including land surveys, urban planning, road network design, crop yield estimation and disaster relief. It is, however, fairly well understood that the GFN satellites are used by the Chinese military. Reason being, information on the first seven satellites in the GFN series were highly detailed and well understood, but from GFN 8 and onward, very little information has been disclosed about them, suggesting that they may support military missions as well as civilian ones. While Long March 4B was the only orbital rocket launch of the week, NASA did execute a successful sounding rocket suborbital launch. This was the Magix 2 mission, launched aboard a Black Brand 9 on the 16th of July. Here's a picture of it on the pad at the White Sands Missile Range, and here it is in flight. 
There's no video that I can find unfortunately, but here's a video of a different Black Brand 9 mission to give you an idea of what it looked like. The Magix 2 mission's full name was the Marshall Grazing Incident X-Ray Spectrometer Mission, aiming to investigate why the sun's corona is hotter than its surface, and it did this using X-Ray Spectroscopy. Research into the sun's corona will be valuable in predicting future solar eruptions which can disrupt communications and satellite operations here at Earth. The mission's payload was retrieved after landing, and the teams are currently processing the data, aiming to improve our understanding of the heating frequency in the sun's active regions, building upon the data obtained by Magix 1, which launched in 2021. Exciting Artemis 2 news now, we've been following the teams at NASA's Mishu Assembly Facility constructing the massive core stage of the SLS rocket for the first crewed Artemis mission, assembling the orange fuel tank section, which of course will feed the four RS-25 engines at the base, operating for over 8 minutes and producing nearly 10 million newtons of thrust and consuming nearly 3 million litres of fuel. Now that the 65 meter core is complete, it's on its way to the Kennedy Space Center for final assembly, as teams moved it onto NASA's Pegasus barge last Tuesday, where it'll be ferried some 900 miles to the Kennedy Space Center. Artemis 1 was definitely one of the highlights of 2022. Wow, was it really a year and a half ago? My biggest wish for Artemis 2 though will be a daytime launch, so that we can actually see the orange beast in its full glory. In sad news now, Viper, standing for Volatiles Investigating Polar Exploration Rover, was a really cool lunar rover mission, aiming to search for lunar resources in the moon's south pole in areas that are in permanent shadow, in particular hunting and mapping the distribution of water ice. However, even though the rover is done, look we've got pictures of it and everything, <laughs> cost growth and delays to readiness resulted in leaders cancelling the programme last week, with the rover now destined for the scrap heap and its components reused for other lunar missions. What I think is wild though, was the fact that the lunar lander for Viper, the commercial Griffin lander built by Astrobotic, and the rocket, a Falcon Heavy, are still going to go to the moon as planned, just instead of taking the Viper rover, they'll just land a mass simulator there instead. Now, I'm, I'm no like economics person, but it just seems a bit silly to you know have the rover completed and have the lander and rocket ready to go, only to then just send a lump of concrete to the surface instead. It's uh, It's such a shame. One rover that did end up being used though was the Curiosity rover, which is still actively exploring Mars, and last week it accidentally crushed a rock when it drove over one, revealing yellow crystals of elemental sulphur, identified by X-ray spectroscopy, marking the first time that pure sulphur has been discovered on Mars. Elemental sulphur is produced during geological processes such as hydrothermal activity and volcanic eruptions, and scientists are currently investigating where this particular sulphur formed by looking for clues in the rocks in the surrounding areas. SpaceX gave us a look at their concept for a space station deorbit vehicle. They were selected by NASA to decommission the aging station by the end of the decade, and we've all been a bit curious about whether or not the vehicle would resemble Dragon, Starship, or something else entirely. Well, this certainly looks to be a Dragon but bigger. SpaceX have stated that this will have six times more propellant and four times the power of the current Dragon spacecraft. Perhaps this is based upon Dragon XL's design, which is a proposed variant of Dragon that will provide gateway logistic services to the Lunar Gateway Station. Blue Origin revealed some new footage from their largely secretive New Glenn project. They recently completed testing of New Glenn's first stage landing legs, which stow inside the rocket during flight and then deploy, a bit like Falcon 9, for landing on a drone ship. I really like this video, especially how all six legs seem to snap into position once they've deployed. And as for the drone ship itself, we've had some recent photos enter the public eye of this. Landing platform Vessel 1, which is uh, not quite as catchy as the name SpaceX gives their drone ships, uh, is a lot larger than SpaceX's, and for good reason. New Glenn is physically a much larger and more powerful rocket than Falcon 9, so I guess it needs that additional size for its landing platform. Laon Aerospace launched a gigantic refinery to Minmus last Saturday, as we continued working on establishing a permanent self-sustaining colony on Kerbin's most distant satellite, in order to further scientific advancements and of course establish a refueling base for interstellar spacecraft, hence the need for the grand refinery that we launched. If you haven't seen the video yet, then check it out via that link on screen, and of course, massive, massive thank you to all my supporters on the left there, who helped make all of this content possible. But that's it for another episode of Space This Week, I do hope you enjoyed the show, and if you liked the video, don't forget to leave a like, and I'll catch you in the next one.